Hi, my name is Kara Mack, and I'm Professor of Pediatrics and the Hewitt Andrews Chair in Pediatric Liver Disease here at Children's Hospital Colorado. I'm the Medical Director of our Pediatric Liver Center and the Director of our Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition Fellowship Training Program. Today, I'll be discussing new guidelines from the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases in the Management of Autoimmune Hepatitis. The AASLD is an international organization that is a leader in clinical pathways for chronic liver diseases. In 2018, adult and pediatric hepatologists convened to work on updating the ASLD guidelines for autoimmune hepatitis. This process took approximately 18 months to complete, and it was a true honor to chair this initiative and to work with world-renowned experts in this field. This initiative was also one of the first adult and pediatric combined guidelines for AASLD, whereby the pediatric hepatologist contributed to all of the guidance and guidelines statements. These guidelines are available on the AASLD website and were recently published in Hepatology. Autoimmune hepatitis is an immune-mediated attack on the liver tissue. The prevalence in children is three out of 100,000 individuals. The diagnostic criteria includes elevated liver, AST, and ALT, an elevated total serum, IgG level, and at least one positive autoantibody as shown here. In addition, one must have the characteristic liver histologic findings of interface hepatitis. On the right is an example of this. The top panel shows the pink liver cells lined up in cords. The lower panels is the liver histology from a patient with autoimmune hepatitis, and the liver cells are being damaged by excessive T cells that appear as dark purple cells in this picture. In addition to the guideline statements that I'll be going over in detail, our group also established numerous practice guidance statements. A guidance statement is a consensus statement developed by the panel based on formal review of all available literature and heavily weighted by expert opinion and experience. Listed here are all of the topics that have a guidance statement associated with them in the new practice guidelines. The guidelines that I'll be discussing all pertain to the management of autoimmune hepatitis. A guideline is a recommendation based on evidence derived from systematic review of the literature in addition to expert opinion. These systematic reviews were performed independently by the Mayo Clinic Evidence-Based Practice Center. The grade assessment for clinical studies was used. The rating quality ranged from high to very low. The strength determinants were ranked depending on the question being asked, and the strength and implications of the final guideline recommendations were determined. The objectives of this talk will be, one, to provide education on recommendations for the most effective first-line treatment therapies for autoimmune hepatitis, two, to outline best practices for the use of second-line therapies in the setting of first-line treatment failure or incomplete treatment response for autoimmune hepatitis, and three, to provide recommendations related to the long-term use of steroids after liver transplant for autoimmune hepatitis. Shown here is the complete systematic review data for all three systematic reviews. The initial search of the database identified over 1,700 studies. Of these, 578 full-text articles were assessed for eligibility, and the vast majority were excluded due to multiple concerns such as study design. This resulted in only a few studies for qualitative or quantitative synthesis analyses. In the first systematic review, we asked the question, is first-line treatment with prednisone plus azathioprine superior to budesonide plus azathioprine in the patient with newly diagnosed autoimmune hepatitis? The reason this is so important is that historically, prednisone with azathioprine has been used to induce remission. However, prednisone has significantly greater number and severity of side effects compared to budesonide. The meta-analysis revealed that biochemical remission was more likely with the use of budesonide and azathioprine compared to prednisone and azathioprine, with an odds ratio of 2.19. Shown here is a forest plot that summarizes the impact of the studies, and if the average of all studies is greater than one, 
then it shifts to the right and it would favor budesonide, as shown here with the diamond shape. So based on the systematic review and expert opinion, the final guideline recommendation is that for children and adults who present with autoimmune hepatitis, in the absence of cirrhosis or acute severe disease, the ASLD suggests that either budesonide with azathioprine or prednisone with azathioprine can be used as first-line treatment. Secondly, for children and adults who present with cirrhosis or acute severe autoimmune hepatitis, the ASLD suggests that budesonide not be used. And the reason for this is that, one, patients who have cirrhosis have increased portosystemic shunting and decreased budesonide drug bioavailability. And two, the use of budesonide to treat acute severe autoimmune hepatitis is completely unknown and therefore not recommended. The second systematic review pertained to the question of whether mycophenolate mofetil, or MMF, or tacrolimus had superior efficacy as second-line therapy for autoimmune hepatitis. We considered second-line therapy in the following situations. One, treatment failure defined as worsening liver tests or histology findings despite first-line therapy compliance. Two, an incomplete response, defined as improvement of the liver tests, yet insufficient to satisfy criteria for biochemical remission within six months of first-line therapy. And I should say that biochemical remission is defined as complete normalization of your AST, ALT, and serum IgG. And then the third reason to consider second-line therapy would be treatment intolerance, defined as the inability to continue the first-line therapy due to drug-related side effects. The systematic review revealed no significant differences in outcomes between the use of tacrolimus or MMF, as shown here with the forest plot showing the diamond shape average crossing the midline at one. Therefore, in children and adults with autoimmune hepatitis who have treatment failure, incomplete response, or drug intolerance to first-line agents, the AASLD suggests that the use of either MMF or tacrolimus to achieve and maintain biochemical remission. Based on the superior ease of use and safer side effect profile, the ASLD suggests a trial of MMF over tacrolimus as the initial second-line agent in patients with autoimmune hepatitis. The final systematic review addressed the question of whether or not the long-term use of steroids after liver transplant was associated with improved outcomes compared to weaning off of steroids. Many centers often keep patients on steroids indefinitely after transplant with the thought that it may decrease rejection or the recurrence of the autoimmune hepatitis, as well as improve graft and patient survival. The systematic reviews revealed that there was no significant difference between the steroid management strategies after liver transplant for autoimmune hepatitis, with similar outcomes whether or not that patient was maintained on steroids long term. Therefore, Based on the limited data to support the long-term use of steroids after liver transplant for autoimmune hepatitis, the ASLD suggests that a gradual withdrawal of steroids be considered after liver transplant. The creation of these guidelines did show us that there are many unmet needs in autoimmune hepatitis that warrant further research, and these entail large, appropriately powered, multi-centered comparative effectiveness trials, it also includes research on prognostic biomarkers that would predict the risk of treatment failure, treatment relapse, or progression to cirrhosis. We need research on therapeutic biomarkers that reflect biochemical and histologic responses. And finally, studies of pharmacologic agents that could restore the homeostatic mechanisms that are involved in the abnormal immune responses found with autoimmune hepatitis. There are many potential targets for these future pharmacologic agents. As shown in this diagram, the pathogenesis of autoimmune hepatitis is very complex and involves activation of both innate and adaptive immune responses, 
as well as decreased regulatory functions. These various immune cells may be specific targets for future therapies. Finally, I think that the future for autoimmune hepatitis therapies is bright, and there are many therapies currently in research trials or being considered for future trials. Shown here are a list of potential therapies based on their mechanisms of action. These include therapies that decrease effector or pathologic T cells or B cells, therapies that decrease the pro-inflammatory cytokines that are damaging the liver or the signaling of these cytokines, and therapies that would enhance immune regulation and offer anti-inflammatory targets. I want to thank everyone for your attention as I updated you on autoimmune hepatitis. And if you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to me by email. Thank you.